So, um, how's life as a solo actor? Are you enjoying yourself? Uh, I'm having a lot of fun. Enjoying the whole process. It's exactly like starting over uh, from, from from the ground up. Uh, it, it's it's just that deal. I mean, we're we're kind of like teamed up on uh, two buses. Actually, we could probably get away with doing one and one sway back semi. You know, it wasn't but two two years ago. I was in uh, we were running with six buses, eight semis. Uh, I'm not sure I ever want to do that again. I'm really happy for the for the opportunity and chance to get, get to do it. It's more streamlined approach now. It's just like driving a Ferrari, you know, with a band. It's like you know, five piece band. They're tight and everything. It's just we can we can call songs in the live shows on the fly. You know, we're not not locked into some uh, some established set list. It takes an army to to freak out and change computers and lights and things like that if uh, if we decide to to call read the crowd you know and uh call uh, call the set list. in terms of like being the only person up on stage is that you know does it do you feel like any extra pressure or is that just you know no, you're obviously absolutely. with the band but i mean you know you used to share the stage before so what's that like yeah no no i i, I do have the, the whole uh the whole rectangle right now i'm not uh I'm not dodging incoming, uh, you know, flying flying cowboys from all angles. Uh Uh-huh. And, uh, no, I dig it. I can can stop and talk, you know. Before, it just, by, uh, I guess, osmosis almost, it it, it just, uh, kicks assumed the role of the, uh, kind of the the MC and front guy, guy. Uh, now I have the opportunity to stop and talk and relate, uh, and actually uh, you know, connect with people, uh, and that's a, that's a huge dynamic to uh, to what's going on. You know, I mean, so many so many people from from the the start came to me, promoters, uh, our agents at, at William Morris, and said, "Said you're going to love this, RD." He said. People that I'm talking to, even some you know, kind of distant, removed promoters, are going. Well, here go. Well, I've got Ronnie Dunn, or I can give you, uh, uh, you know, Eric Church or Jason Aldean, and they go, Who, "Who's Ronnie Dunn?" Mm-hmm. And they go, it's "The guy was with Brooks and Dunn." They go, "Oh, oh, oh, him? Yeah, okay." <laughs> so, so I'm having to go out. I mean, just, just just as immediately as my wife was laughing, and we were all talking at a management meeting the other day. She said, "Walk up to the microphone, and just tell them who you are." She said, "Say your name." She said, "You know, just you're having I'm having to reintroduce myself to to people." It's so so accustomed to that Brooks and Dunn brand and name, right? And, uh, you know, on your album, the, uh, that came out last year, you also sort of, it was the same kind of idea, you sort of reintroducing yourself musically. So, were there things you felt you hadn't been able to express, you know, through songs when you were, you know, doing things for the duo? Was it just a more personal kind of record? Or? Yeah, well, you know, in terms of, especially in ballads, I think it's like, I can, I can get a little more intimate with the, with the subject content, you know, and aim it more, more to, uh, uh, you know, a female, uh, and, and feel more comfortable that they're delivering, you know, a love song per se, uh, than I could with, you know, kind of two, two guys who've been marketed and, uh, sort of just like, you know, honky tonk, rowdy, uh, hombres. Kind of party kind of band or something. Yeah, yeah. Now I can sing a love song and feel like I'm not creeping the cowboy out, you know. Yeah, right. And the next to me. And the process for the album was pretty intense from what I gather. Well, you know, I, I said that because it, it was a big step, you know, in a lot of ways, jumping from Brooks and Don to, to, you know, an adventure like this. So, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm you know, I'm in the process of working on, on the second one now, and I, I have my seat legs now. I mean, it, whether I, I just I feel really good about it. It's, it's this is a lot more fun. I can let my hair down, and I know kind of what not and 
doing with what we do, and I don't feel as uh, I'm, not, I'm not as worried about uh, about its you know, subsequent success since I'm doing it to do it because I like the music. You know, is this going to come out like next year or? No, 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 no date yet. I was just going with the, over with the uh, engineers and some of the guys mm-hmm. playing on the record. We're going to start uh, here in well, pretty soon. So I saw that you um, had filled in for uh, Kix Brooks, I guess, in March when he couldn't do a show. So I gathered that everything, you know, the split was, you know, kind of a mutual thing and it's, it's positive between the two of you? Or Yeah, it was amicable. Mm-hmm. We're, uh, we're good. I think I think he's out doing stuff, getting ready to... Uh, to release his uh, inaugural solo project uh, in early September. So the idea of being separate artists has just sort of felt like the time had come for that. It was done everything you yeah. could do as a duo, or yeah, it, exactly. You know, in a lot of ways, you know, from the start, we we had always felt like we were we were separate solo artists up there on stage. Uh, that's probably always the case, you know. With the Eagles, there are probably four or five guys up there who all think they're solo acts and, and, and are good solo acts. It's just kind of what it is. You, do you ever see a time you might, you know, do something together? Or is that not something you really think about right now? Nah. I'm, I'm, I'm too busy having fun with the solo thing right now. I really am. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's, uh, you know, we're, we're making progress. It's almost like grassroots campaigning for, you know, for, for office. And I've forgotten mm-hmm what that felt like and what all it took, you know, to get to the point that we got with uh, Brooks and Dunn. You know, you have to go out and uh, uh, campaign from door to door, you know, it's a club at a time, uh, a, a, a gig at a time. You know, back in the day, it was, you know, going from radio station to radio station. Uh, is that is that still something that artists do, or is, is it more the social media stuff or the live shows? What, what's, what's the key? It's, it's a combination of all of that. I mean, now now we have to hire teams, or, or it's necessary, uh, or felt like it is necessary to uh, to hire social media or promo teams. You know, you hire a traditional publicist uh, for promo. You depend on uh, on the labels and uh, and radio for for a great deal. Radio is still a, a big big uh, dynamic, you know, in the equation. And uh, being able to, to get that is fairly critical to an extent. And, uh, you know, we have to play it. But radio, the, you know, the playing field has changed dramatically mm-hmm. uh, in just the last, hell, the last, you know, four years. Oh, man, we're, we're going to get off into some crazy business stuff and 360 contracts and uh-huh. um, the this, this state of labels and things like that. It's probably right. some wacky business stuff that has changed the playing field in a, in a big way. Labels can't make right. a profit anymore unless, uh, you know, Unless uh, an act signs mm-hmm. a, a 360. I mean, I don't know how many guys who are you know, label heads and friends uh, working at labels that just go, we cannot make a profit uh, and get in the black without having a 360 deal. Right. And that's, that's, that's hard as an established act and a challenge to turn around and go, really? Really? So now I'm going to cut you in on t shirts, ticket sales. Uh, Publishing and whatever else. It's kind of back to the era of, in some ways, of, you know, give them a Cadillac, make them happy. They'll tell you it's a necessity. Now they talk about instead of record contracts, you hear partnerships. They still, they still have the lion's share of the, you know, the, uh, the stranglehold on, on radio, the promotion. Right. Band. But more and more people are turning to uh, uh, independent means and uh, other ways of going about achieving that. Right. A lot of these guys are on independent labels. Jason Aldean, you know, for mm-hmm. instance, and as an indie, doing imprint stuff. Primarily, we're using labels that not, not for not much more than uh, uh, radio promotion. We don't, right. we don't necessarily yeah. need it for distribution or anything else anymore. And this is stuff you probably know. So I want to talk a little about the show itself. You said I know you said it's a kind of a little more uh, streamlined version of, of things than what you're doing with with uh, Brooks. So are you um, kind of what's the music musical content you're covering 
some of your biggest hits from Brooks and Dundays and then, then focusing on some of the solo stuff? Or? Yeah, 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 I'm mixing them up. I think it would be uh, maybe wrong for me not to. Uh, it, but, but throwing more solo stuff and actually some things that were from, from the, the B&D days that, that didn't see the, the light of day on the, on the commercial front a radio that uh, you know, I'm going back and, and picking up. And then throwing new stuff in at the same time, stuff that hasn't been exposed yet, just to try it out. That's something we didn't have the freedom or felt like we didn't have the freedom to do with, with Brooks and Don. So you never know at this point, I mean, where we're going to go. The fun is, right. you never know, you don't know. And have you, uh, you played Atlantic City, you know, I think a bunch of times. Um, do you have any uh, special connections to the place or, you know, any? do you like to gamble or? Uh, you know, I used to, to uh, until I learned not to. No, uh, I, I, I gamble too much in the music business. Okay, and the last thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, I was, your, uh, Experience of having uh, Johnny Cash as your your first landlord in, in Nashville it sounds like quite the intro to the country music world to have a legend be the person who you're going. So yeah, it, it my wife's first husband he passed away a uh, uh, long time ago. But anyway, was the guy that built the car that John sings uh, sang about one piece uh-huh. at the time. He was a uh, uh, from Oklahoma. Anyway, he and uh, Janine, my wife, and, and John and June became best of friends. Traveled all over the, the world together. Literally, just that tight. So when June heard that uh, Janine was, in fact, for five or six years, whose death was dating a uh, uh, a singer, a country singer, she called one day to actually read her the Riot Act uh, about you know, the cons of hanging with anybody in the music business. Uh, took her out shopping once and, and just just let it all out. She said, "Maybe she says, you know, the chances of, of you know, anyone making it in the music business first are, are you know nailed to nothing." And she said, "If you do, it, it, you know, if you get one hit." You know, the chances of any any longevity are, are next to nothing. And she said, and then there's all the dysfunction that goes with it. And she continued, you know, went on to give her a long list of of the downside. You know, imagine Johnny in his in his wilder days, right? And right. Uh, and Roseanne and, and Rodney Crowell had been married, and they they've gone through. Anyway, she just laid it all out. So Janine and June was convinced that. I was going to hang with it. They called one day from Tennessee, uh, and we were in Oklahoma at the time, mm-hmm. and uh, asked if we would like to come live in the, uh, the log house they had on the mountain. They had a little enclave of five or six pre-Civil War log cabins they had put together. It was just mm-hmm. at the time, we didn't know. We were thinking we were going to come here, live in a garage apartment, and do what you do. Well, right. Mm-hmm. We got up here with our our, our you know, pickup truck and our U-Haul trailer, and uh, you know, in the middle of the night, drove to the top of this mountain. And it's two pre-Civil War houses put together by some designer out of Palm Beach or something, mm-hmm. and it looked like something out of a magazine. It was in and he started bawling. I'm like, mm-hmm. are you kidding me? It's a mistake. Uh, but no, the house was sitting vacant, and June uh, said, you know, you can pay, uh, you know, anywhere from 100 to $600 a month, and half the time I would take the rent to them, and they wouldn't take it mm. uh, until uh, B&B got up and rolling, and we were able to come up with a down payment on our, on our own home. Mm-hmm. But that was it. John had his riding cabin. Not, it wasn't 75 yards from where we were, so mm-hmm. I, I got to visit with him uh, quite a bit. Yeah, and, uh, it's, it was it was good. It was a good experience, great experience, which, as you can imagine. Did you talk music with him at all? Or? Yeah, yeah. I remember one of the a lot, but I remember he and I sitting out one day. I, he was I, right after I got my record due. He says, "What, what are you going to wear?" He said, "I heard about you getting uh, signed to to Aris. I said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." So I'm pretty excited. He says, "No kidding, good for you." And he said, "Well, 
what, what, what are you guys going to shoot? I said, I don't know. I'm going to figure out what to wear first. And I, I said, you went around, do you? And I was laughing, joking. And he goes, yeah, yeah I, kind of, I kind of do, but you got to promise uh, if if I let you do it, and you may not want to, but he says, don't tell our And he mm-hmm. comes up about half an hour later and uh, pops the trunk on his big black Mercedes, and there's a Johnny Cash custom suit that he'd had back in the mm-hmm. 70s. And he goes, hey, See if this doesn't fit you. And sure enough, I put it on. It felt like a glove. It was, wow. it was that thin back in the day. Anyway, he said, mm-hmm. where is this one? So he said, Manuel, you know, the famous tailor, made it for me. And uh, he said, you know, try try a couple of shots. Just see how it feels, you know. He said, they'll give you some right. something. I'm like, damn. So I put it on the back of the uh, the first CD that, that we did. Okay. But we uh, but here's here's a better one. One day we were, we were sitting out, the sun was going down, and we were sitting on the stone wall, kind of looking out and just shooting the breeze. And I was talking about Garth. Garth was like in the middle of his thing, just exploding. All It was just, you know, Garth world. And I said, God, I said, like, he's selling like, I don't know how many records, you know, a week right now. And John was kind of quiet. I went on for, you know, way too long. And uh, John looked over and goes, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I did that once. <laughs> like, man, I said they're bragging about somebody like go golf around Johnny Cash. <laughs> right, right. Anyway, just kind of a sobering moment. I'm thinking, oh, shit. Yeah, yeah I guess you did, didn't you? Right, right, yeah. You forgot you were talking to a legend there, I guess, for a minute. Well, yeah, yeah. So. Sounds like he put you at ease, so you just sort of were. Do what? You know, he put you at very much ease then when you when you were with him. He was oh, very much comfortable so. with. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, he was great. Yeah, so cool, so personal. I mean, it's like being part of the family in a lot of ways. Well, Ryan, it's great right. to talk to you. Appreciate you taking the right. time out to chat. Well, thank you. I love. All right, you. see you guys up there. Thank you, man. Bye. Okay, thank you so much. Bye bye.